director for communications, and we have staff also here from the fire department. So, um, assistant fire uh, marshal law is here. Yeah. Chief law, um, Kathy Harrell, uh, Captain Sai, and others. So, um, before we get into the nitty gritty, can we just get a, um, a little bit of an intro from folks who are here from community? Would you mind telling us your name, uh, which neighborhood or community group you represent? Let's start with you. Yeah, Francesco Cucucci. Uh, I am in the street closure at the Jasper Place on Green Street, North Beach, with the California Fish Market. Jenna Clyde, I have the studio cafe and we have a street closure in Carolina Valley between like Broadway and Pacific and Columbus and Grand Pacific. Right, and that North Beach showing up. Uh, uh, Harris Anthony from Exchange, we have a street closure in the Western Nation, 1700 Buckle Farrell, between Fillmore and Stack. Okay. Hi, I'm Cal Callahan, District Manager for the Leather and LGBTQ Cultural District. Uh, for the last few years, we've been using shared spaces to close off 12th Street once a month uh, from April to October for some second Saturdays. So, the uh, better fair part of the press. Uh, I'm John Lindsay. I have uh, the Great Highway Gallery in the Outer Sunset, and uh, I have a parklet up front, and my neighbors want to come by. They're, <laughs> but <laughs> it's never complicated. <laughs> Katie. And I'm Katie Birnbaum. Um, I'm from uh, Sunday Street Cool City and all of them helping helping where I can. Um, so here to, to learn and help. I think it's pretty fair to say we wouldn't be at this place in San Francisco's uh, activation of roadways if it weren't for Katie and the team in the city. So huge thanks to Liverpool City for doing Sunday Streets and many other things. Um, Livable City is also going to be working with the Shared Spaces Program to provide technical assistance and uh, helping to roll out the program in this calendar. All right, and so with that, I'll turn it over, I think, to Monica. I shall step aside. Walking and enjoying the space, 
Um, it can be outdoor recreation activities like kids or sport activities. Um, you can have an entertainment and amplified sound activity. That does require a separate and additional permit, um, but that is allowed. Um, obviously outdoor seating for cafes, so that's different. You may have a parklet, but also have sort of set up a booth or seating. Um, we saw this in Hay Street, for example, um, or retail display. So a lot of different types of uses that can happen in the public right away. Something important to call out for shared spaces, um, for that reoccurring nature, we do have sort of additional criteria that we look at for streets that are, when we're looking at closing them so regularly, um, we do generally look for streets that don't have transit, have low traffic volumes and speeds, few driveways, so few sort of um, parking lots or residents that are impacted, and no fire police stations. So again, maybe for like a one-time special event, we could be more lenient and make accommodations for that, but something that's happening so recurrent and recurring, um, these are some of the things that we, we stay away from. So just to think about if you're, if you are a street that you're interested in closing that may have a bus running on it, for example, that that may not be possible, and there are just um, additional considerations um, to think about for eligibility. Any questions so far? I know I said I'd keep this like, feel free to jump in. Um, so, um, more design criteria. Um, yeah, there is um, specific requirements. This applies to a special event is not not to share spaces. Specific requirements for serving alcohol that um, to be aware of. Um, you can't, um, when you're drawing up your site plan, you cannot obstruct any sort of utilities or manhole covers. This is similar to parklets as well. Um, so you keep an eye out for that when you're drawing up your site plan. Um, obviously, good neighbor, you need to keep things clean um, and clear of food waste. So this is a responsibility when you're setting but closing down. Um, and furniture obviously has to be within the food area. Plan. We approve if you want to set up certain eating or food in one part of the building. <coughs> that's what we would expect it to happen every time you close the street. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, other things to call out. Um, nothing can be fastened. This may seem obvious, but important to call out. Nothing can be fastened to the street or sidewalk. This is because everything's movable. Obviously, it's set up and taken down. Um, See, nothing can be placed in intersections or crosswalks, especially if it's one that's like that cars are still traveling through in another direction. So um, that's really important. Um, and obviously, as you go through the approval process, if there's other city regulations and codes where it's possible, let me know. Um, so I have two slides on fire department requirements. I'd like to call it chief law, um, just to call it some unique things that they look for. And then Jared Hormostel, our engineer, will walk us through. Chad Vaughn, Assistant Fire Marshal of the Fire Department, uh, Division of Fire Prevention. Uh, we also have other members here that uh, we can ask questions to later if we want to get more into details. But I'm going to cover up the basic fire department uh, requirements we've had for many years. And we, you know, guys are familiar with the street closures. I'm familiar with all yours as well. As my uh, staff reviews them, and we contact the fire stations and what's acceptable and where we can actually gain access to the buildings and fire escapes. So that's basically why we have some basic minimum fire department requirements. Um, there, there may be more in certain areas depending on operational needs. So that is based upon your application and our review. So anyway, um, for years, a uh, minimum 14 foot wide emergency access lane. Uh, your streets in North Beach are a lot more narrow, impossible to some of them. So it's a case-to-case -case basis where they only have 12 feet curb to curb. So in that case, we actually don't have 14 feet minimum requirement. We have stationary staff there, lightweight furniture in case the fire engine or fire truck can move it, you know, or actually you guys are responsible to move it, you know, in case of an emergency. So there are exceptions. So I'll just cover the 14 foot wide emergency access lane must be maintained throughout the entire length of the street closure. 14 feet is not necessarily a great deal of room, especially for reoccurring streets that are wider. Um, our fire department rigs are 
about 10 feet, four inches wide. So if we do have a fire or an emergency, we do need to pass each other up ladders up. You guys have seen videos of our fire department where we have a minimum of 12 or 13 fire department <coughs> showing up within five minutes if there was a fire on the street. So um, we want to prepare for that. So we'd say 14, but it could be 20. And at Valencia Street, it's actually 26 because it's a major thoroughfare. So I want to cover that. Um, there is also it's standard for shared spaces structures as well. So daylighting 20 feet, nothing 20 feet from the intersection. Uh, that has to do with our turns and our uh, auto turn. Our fire department rigs take a kind of wide turns. So if there's structures, sometimes we can't enter the streets and if it's a 14 foot fire lane, we can't get square to enter that and go through. So there's two things we have to think about when we review these, uh, these applications. Is one is access through the street going from one section to the other, especially with traffic and gridlock these days, um, it's, it's congestion. It's getting through to an emergency, but also the operations part of it, where there's 13 fire rigs trying to position to get to a, a, a building that may have a fire in it. Um, cool. Oh, how do we move these slides forward? Uh, the uh, arrow button. keys. The arrow keys, let's do that. Uh, yeah, since it's a small group, do you have questions on that? Okay, thank you. If you'd like to answer. Oh, we have oh. one. Go ahead. Does, does that have to be in the application when you set the site map? Yes, okay. yeah, that's pretty standard. Yeah, fire department access, and Jared can speak to that later maybe. Yeah, we'll talk about site maps. We want to make this process as efficient as possible, so we have a lot of checkpoints, you know, fire department access, DPW, utilities need to be cleared off the whole gamut of uh, city agency cooperation, and we've worked so long time to kind of come up with these guidelines. So with your questions, we can actually, you know, figure out more guidance for you. <coughs> so we're totally open to questions and suggestions. Um, let's see, fire department, permits, oh, maybe. Maybe that's more about you guys. Can the same lane also be considered to be used for a bus, in case there's a bus, and are to their food or by the same way maybe the basket moves up, there's more shots to their food. That's something that we generally don't like to do because with the bus coming through an area that people aren't expecting a vehicle to be present in, that can pose a, a risk to people who might just be milling about on the street. So in the case of the fire vehicle, it's it's gonna be uh, accompanied by, you know, lights, sirens, things that call people's attention to the fact that there's a vehicle that needs to get through here and people will understand that they need to clear that lane. With a bus, that's not so much the case. And so that's not really something that we consider appropriate in, in the past. Thank you. Mm -hmm. cool. um, I'm going to cover just a quickly about events we have in the city that kind of build our city and they're a big part of our city. Um, <coughs> We have, so there's permits required if there's cooking, like a propane and um, other things like that, open flame. We check for safety, we do leak tests, we make sure there's no danger for the, uh, the workers here, the staff, as well as the occupants in the, um, in the event. Um, events with the expected attendance of 500 or more may need to provide a public safety plan to, pro to provide crowd managers. So basically, if we have larger events, we look at the site plan and we, we need ways of egress and pathways that need to be maintained in case of any emergency. I can list a ton of them. But exit signs need to be, uh, this is what we do as a fire department. We make sure we don't just respond to the area, but we make sure it's generally safe. Lighting, you know, whatever it's indoor or outdoors. So events with 500 people or more. Um, and also, this third bullet point will change, but it says events with street closure permits that have a planned attendance of more than 500 people. It says 1,000 up here, but it was 500 people will require an operational permit to conduct an outdoor assembly event from the fire department. So that's basically any five, 500 people or more planned. Uh, we, we review the plans and site plans. We look at exits. We look at where your bathrooms are. We make sure the cooking's not near you know, a certain area, we look at stage required, if there's a stage put up there, we make sure it's safe, whether there's engineered plans, 
So there's a lot we look at, and uh, it's all going to be on the application, and it will have our staff kind of review it. So that's all I have, I think. Two slides? Yes. Any questions on fire burn? I have a side question. You mentioned the propane. Yes. And uh, what is the story about the propane and how that we use it? Yes. So we do have a website. Traditionally, we regulate propane, any L LPG. It's a heavy gas liquid propane. It's a heavy gas. So if it's a small leak, it'll kind of go to the floor and be there for weeks. So we check food trucks. We check any use of propane. It's not supposed to be in any buildings in San Francisco, whether you're storing it or using it, because it's such a dangerous gas. So it, it's due to the, uh, the uh, properties of the gas. So we, that's why we do the leak test. So we have our operational permits department where Chief Harold um, is in charge of reviewing all LPG, liquid, propane, gas permits. They're operational permits and um, the guidelines are on it. Basically, if you have mushroom heaters in your shared spaces and they fall, they need to fall to the ground or else they don't shut off. So they'll keep burning. That's why there's a five foot clearance around them. So they'll just keep blowing heat burning structure. We've seen, you know, if, if anyone's walked around the city, they've seen uh, the burnt structures and melted LED lights from the propane heaters because it puts out so much heat. So they're, so they're dangerous and we just want to make sure they're safe. What about the storage? Yeah, they can't be inside any buildings and or on the streets for DPW regulations, streets or sidewalks. Um, they're just hazardous. Someone could open it and like a place so on fire, they can shoot it. Right. I mean, it's a weird world. We so they can't be inside the building. They can't be outside. Can't be on the roof of a building. Can't even be carried through a building. So they can't be outside either. Right? No. Uh, no. I mean, there's certain. So is it true the story that we should bring it in the morning and bring it back home? That would right? probably be your best bet. Um, you know. Who knows if there's companies that will actually pick it up and drop it off for you? But you know there are places where it's where we license or we have permits for them to store it. Gas stations, for example, they have bollards in front of them, right. cages. They're locked. They have the DOT placard in front of it. Uh, when propane tanks are un, unstaffed and just sitting out there, it's just a potential for hazard for someone and to. Would you guys consider it for us to have a cage, same as the gas station, located on top of it? That is not allowed by DPW. That to is be on top of the park? Uh, not on the street? Uh, well, you have a 10 foot roof limit as well. So you can't have any structures about 10 feet. Is it 9 feet or 10 feet? 10 feet. And then if your sidewalk, if you look at the guidelines, if your sidewalk is under 10 feet, you can't have any roof overhangs anyway because of laddering. So you're limited on top of I've never seen that, but it's. So that's something to discuss. It's also a question that we've never heard of. So thank you. <laughs> I mean, have to figure out the storage of those. Yeah, parts. yeah. Captain Sai is he deals with this every so, day, so he can actually uh, to answer you your question. If you have a roof, you're not going to get a permit. Right. So you wouldn't be able to store it because the roof would be not existing. Right. That's a good call. Yeah. Thank you. And so if I don't have the roof, then if you don't have the roof, then I can have the cage, same as the decision. Uh, no, so the fire code, <coughs> it has to be outdoors, well ventilated and secured, right, for our purposes. When you have a cage, more than likely it's going to be on the sidewalk or the street, right, where DPW or and MTA regulate that. The problem is, if you're going to have a cage, you're going to need, um, well, vehicle posts, right? It was just a, a few months ago or so, a car went into one of these structures. Most of these cages on the street are located at the ends of these structures where cars are going to hit. So if the car were to come into contact with that at any rate of speed, it's going to cause an explosion. So you're going to need vehicle posts, right? That's a permanent structure that's going to be attached to the street, right? So that's that's a, that's a different animal. Now, now you're dealing with a, a, something that's got to be built into the street to protect these cages. Right. So more than likely, I mean, you're, you're going to have to talk to DPW or NTA about What about that. the cage inside the park? We lose a paper amount of we can keep legal okay. I think according to the guidelines, the structures are not supposed to be used for storage. But again, that's something that you have to talk to DPW or MTA. They're, yeah. they're, they're only for you know your customers and, and stuff. They're not supposed to be used for storage. So that, that's the issue. 
Well, yes, so what well, Captain Sider is referring to, if you do have a roof overhang, you aren't allowed yeah. propane heaters anyway. So that's a good point. And the operational permit, is that like a separate permit and a separate fee, or is that yes. just part of okay. And what is the fee associated with that operational permit? So Chief Harrell, the fee, what's the initial fee? So the, kind of uh, the application fee is like three hundred eighty seven dollars. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's to, to top apply for a permit and top of the shared spaces permit that fee as well. Yes. And, permit. and then you might have multiple fire department permits, and I believe. Yeah, and then also inspections. If inspections are after hours, um, there's an additional fee for that. So if there's a thousand people, is that like at the entire time of the street closure, a thousand, or at any given time, are you regulating? So that would be at any given time. Okay. Um, and it'll be 500. So any given time, more than 500 people uh, according to our San Francisco fire code, it requires uh, a permit from the fire department. Is and that's an inspection. not the case for special event permits, right? Like you've got a special event permit already is an assembly permit? So, um, so the shared space is new. So ISCA, an ISCA permit coverage is, is a street fair. You, you, when you have an ISCA permit, um, you, you apply for a, a street fair permit. Um, for shared spaces, you know, there'll be some permit associated through the fire department. And is it gonna be considered a, a assembly permit for every single instance of it, or is it for the duration of the whole uh, street closure permit? I think it's the duration of the whole street closure. You're not gonna have to reapply for every. For every yeah, so there's a time period. What do you guys do in six months? One year. So yeah, you have a year. So we review it, and if there's any changes, you have to let us know, or we might have drop by inspections. Actually, Jared and Nick Chapman are good at making sure your plans are uh, for design. You guys are following them because a lot of times, especially with COVID and the pandemic, everything shifted. People moved their arcades. We had blockages. We had delays in the response times because people weren't adhering to the permit conditions. And uh, yeah, I don't need to use examples, but. We're gonna now that these are permanent. These are probably, and we spent more time with the guidelines. I think we're pretty solid in working together with the agency. We can, um, we're here for you. We want these to happen. We just want to make sure we check all the boxes and uh, say for you guys and your documents. Cool. Anything else? We have time at the end for questions too. So. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I'm Jared Hornbostel. I'm a traffic engineer at SFMTA. Uh, I work closely with uh, Nick Chapman, who does primarily the special event uh, permitting, um, but I focused more on the shared spaces. So I'm uh, glad to see you all here this morning. Nice to uh, put faces to names. Um, one, of, one of the important components that we want to make sure uh, we include with these roadway shared spaces is that they're accessible to the entirety of the community. So there are two key ways that we can do that. Uh, one of the key ways is that when we provide uh, tables and chairs for folks for dining or for uh, watching entertainment or whatever, we want to make sure that we're also providing accessible spaces, uh, accessible tables, so there's a diagram here that shows kind of what that looks like. Um, but one of the other important aspects is that we keep a, a clear sidewalk and a clear pathway for uh, everyone to be able to travel through the event, uh, even if they're not stopping at the at the closure or at the at the event. So um, the roadway permits don't allow you to put anything on the sidewalk. They don't. Uh, you know, cover anything that would be on the sidewalk, and so we want to make sure those sidewalks are clear during these roadway closures. Um, so, as as uh, as we've been mentioning, the uh, situations for each of these roadways are unique. Um, we have a wide range of, of <coughs> different roadways uh, represented here. We have everything from narrow alleys that don't have vehicle traffic all the way to a much wider streets with, uh, with vehicles on them. And so 
it can be a, a little bit of a challenge to speak about all these different things broadly, um, but when you submit your application, uh, one of the roles that I will fulfill is that I will take a look at it and make sure that if there are situations that are unique to your application that we're getting the information that we need from you to be able to review and, uh, and process them. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to be looking for is to make sure that we have community support for these. Um, and so when you submit your applications, you're going to be asked to attach something that shows community support. That can be done through a whole lot of different ways. There's not really a, a set example of what that should look like. Um, and for many of you, you've been operating these closures for, oops, for a year or two now. And so we already have a good idea that there is some level of community support, but uh, the way that I think about that is one of the things that you might do is include a paragraph write-up where you talk about how you've reached out to the community, how you've worked with either people who live on the block or businesses on the block to make sure their needs are met, um, whether that's access to their driveway or loading for their business or whatever, um, if you can just kind of talk through that in a, a paragraph or two, that's helpful for us to know that um, that you've done that kind of legwork because that's something that we do expect our, our roadway closure applicants to do and to continue to do throughout the um, you know duration of the permit to guarantee uh, the continued success of these uh, spaces. Uh, another component that uh, is included with this is that there will be a public hearing before we issue a permit for these uh, um, roadway closures moving forward. So that's something that we've always done for the temporary special events, um, but it's something that's a new component for the uh, shared spaces closures. So. That means that we'll be asking you to post notices like we have in the past. Um, but in this case, the notices will say, if you have comments, you can reach out to SFMTA or you can attend this public hearing. And so that public hearing gives the community a chance to uh, participate in that dialogue. And ideally, that participation is, is positive and you've worked out any concerns ahead of time so that uh, and so that's what we're looking for in that documentation of, of uh, community support. So there are a few other key differences between the pandemic era shared spaces roadway closure program and the legislative program that begins in April that I wanted to highlight. Uh, you can still apply for temporary permits uh, as long as your event is only through the end of March, March 31st. But for anything that is to continue beyond March 31st, you'll need to apply for this um, legislated uh, roadway closure permit. The temporary permits are free. Uh, we'll talk about the permit fees associated, associated with the legislative permits in a little bit. Um, the temporary programs haven't required the site plan in the past, um, but the permanent legislative program will require a site plan, uh, primarily so that we're able to address some of these concerns that uh, that we've been talking about in terms of where things are placed and how things are laid out on the street. And we'll talk more in detail about that as well. Um, and then the temporary permits have uh, required that the sponsors provide their own barricades. Whereas under this uh, legislative program and moving forward, the, the SFMTA is going to provide those barricades to you. So that's one of the things that you're getting uh, with that permit fee, but it also allows us to have a more uniform and more kind of dependable setup. You're going to be responsible for storing those barricades and for putting them out every day, but we're going to give them to you at the beginning of your permit term so that you have them and that they're uh, exactly what we want to see you put out. 
So we can talk a little bit more about that. The actual uh, barricade materials that you're gonna be using is pretty similar to what many of you have already been using over the course of the pandemic. Um, it's primarily gonna be uh, the type three barricades, which are illustrated here in the road close signs, as well as traffic cones that would be put at the end of each block will give you a guidelines document, which is gonna look a little bit different than the, than the one that you've received before. It'll be a little more refined, but it's gonna to explain to you how to set this up. Um, and then, so the, the idea is that once you have an approved permit and prior to your first start date, we're going to arrange a delivery time with you. We're gonna drop these off for you and then you'll have that for a year. So you'll be able to use these materials every week or every month when you activate. Uh, and then at the end of the year, if you decide to apply for a permit for another year, you'll get another set of barricades. So you get one set a year, um, and then it'll be your responsibility to set them up each week and to maintain them for that year. Any questions so far? Yeah, please, go ahead. The barricades are stolen or vandalized as the replacement? Yeah, so that's going to be your responsibility, and hopefully that doesn't happen, but we know that that's, you know, uh, that there's only so much that can be done about that. What we're going to, what we're going to do is give you one set a year, and then if there is, uh, if there is damage or something that occurs, it's going to be your responsibility to uh, procure something or to get something that's basically the same as well. Right, so I'm envisioning what we've been using, which are the big metal cake, you know, mm -hmm. big metal barricades. Mm -hmm. We have one on each side mm -hmm. that comes out from one side of the alley into the alley, and the other the same. So we keep access through the alley for um, pedestrians at all times, mm -hmm. as well as you know maintaining a roadway, you know, just something that's controllable in case there's an emergency. So would you look at that and say? that is an acceptable type of barricade. I mean, if you look at something like that that is an actual barricade, yeah. legal barricade, could that work? So for if your you for your case where your alleyway isn't open to vehicular traffic, mm -hmm. this really doesn't apply. Okay. But you're a particularly unique case. In fact, I think the only uh, roadway shared space where the road isn't used for cars. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I think in your case, that setup makes a lot of sense, uh, whereas this is something that we've envisioned more for a typical street where we're closing it to, to vehicles. Like in, in your case, I'm not sure that we would have a requirement for barricades at all. Okay. Um, and it, if, if we do, it'll be more similar to like what we might require for sidewalk tables and chairs, where really what we're looking for is just to prevent uh, someone with a visual impairment from walking into tables and chairs that are out on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So something that would be detectable with a, with a cane that you know, someone with full vision might be using for instance. For us, it just identifies that there's an event, like there's something yeah. going on. Right. So like, I, I think it would be perfectly acceptable to continue using that kind of stuff. Um, but that's something that Thank we can you. also talk more about for, for your specific needs. Thank you. Any other questions? So as I mentioned briefly, moving forward, there is a fee associated with these uh, legislated roadway closure permits. It's uh, the fee structure is designed in a way to incentivize folks to apply early. That, of course, makes it uh, easier for us to process because it gives us time to review and go back and forth with you, but it, it's also uh, important from your perspective because it gives you enough time to get any ancillary permits ready to get uh, the feedback that you need to refine your site plan to make sure that everything is um, you know, going to work well. And so 
in order to incentivize you to apply early, though, the fees do increase the sooner you get, or the closer you get to the event. Um, and then each year we adjust them for inflation, and, and that's also shown here. Uh, it shows next year's rates that start every June. Um, in this case, the transition is being handled a little bit differently. Um, the application hasn't been up for the full 120 days before uh, the event, and so we've uh, grandfathered everybody who applies, uh, everybody with an existing closure who applies by that um, January 15th deadline into that lowest tier, uh, fee tier, which is $1,150. That will cover your street, with the, your street closure for the year. Uh, it includes you know, our staff time to review, and um, yeah, I think that's pretty self-evident. Uh, any questions about that? We'll talk then about some of the other, um, you can go ahead. Um, for our permit, we did a recurring permit, but we'd like one that's modified. Do we still have time to add a couple more blocks of permit? Yeah, so if you've already applied, we haven't processed any of these yet. Okay. If you've already applied, reach out to us uh, at our shared spaces email, and we'd be happy to talk about that and include that before we go through and process these. Once we've processed and issued a permit, if you decided that you wanted to add on space, um, we'd have to ask you to apply again because we'll have to go through that entire review process again. Okay, and so, so that, that would be an additional application. So that would be like another That, that's a good point. If, for instance, you were reducing scope, maybe you originally closed three blocks uh, you know, every weekend and that's difficult to manage and so you're thinking about scaling back to two blocks, that's something, because it's within what we've already reviewed, as long as the two blocks that stay aren't changing themselves, if it's just removing that chunk and the remainder has already been reviewed, that's something where we wouldn't have to ask you to come back. If you've already reviewed the chunk that remains, then we can just edit your permit and reissue it for the smaller footprint. Uh, if you are gonna rearrange everything within the remaining footprint though, um, it may trigger a, a new review and then a new application. So you know, if you're thinking about those kind of things, please feel free to reach out to us and start that dialogue, and then we're here to kind of advise you as to what that process might look like. So this is some brief guidance on what a site plan might look like, but we know that there's a wide range of uh, different people applying with different uh, skills and abilities and so the first thing I want to say is that your site plan can be prepared in any way it can be hand drawn it can be done in Microsoft Word it could be done uh, more professionally like that that's not what we're concerned about when we're reviewing these site plans what we're concerned about is what's included um, so things that we want to see included is a clear illustration of what streets are closed, where those uh, closure limits are going to be. Uh, we want to be able to see that emergency access lane. So at least the 14 feet in many cases, in some alleyways we may uh, work with the fire department to determine alternatives to provide emergency access. Uh, on some cases, we may need more than the 14 feet and that's something that we'll work with. But whatever, we'll, we'll work with you on determining and we'll work with our partners at the fire department on determining. But whatever we determine, we'll wanna see that on the site plan as well. Um, we'll wanna see where you're putting the booths, if you have booths, 
uh, 10 by 10 pop-ups, tables, chairs. We'll want to see all of those things drawn out. And we'll want to see where that is um, to scale on the map. That's important when we're looking at your activities and events and comparing them to what the street looks like and what's around, uh, you know, what, what the buildings look like on the street. And so we really need to see where those booths are going to be, what each booth is, and, and where those are located. Any stages we'll want to see called out, including if uh, the stage requires a ramp, we'll want to see the ramp shown as well. If there's going to be alcohol service as part of this, we'll want to know where that alcohol service is taking place. So maybe that's uh, part of a restaurant uh, that's serving on the, on the street. We'll want to know where that's occurring. And then there are other ABC permits that are required for that. Um, we'll want to see how you're handling your uh, recycling, composting, and, and waste. Uh, and so we'll want to see if you have trash cans, where those trash cans are. Uh, that should be shown on here. Any kind of fencing or barricades uh, should be shown. Really any physical objects that are going to be out in the roadway, you want to see where those are. Uh, and, that, and the more thorough this site plan is, the easier it is us to look at this quickly and say yes, this meets the requirements <coughs> and, and move you along through the process. Um, the one less obvious thing that we also would like to see on these site plans are the location of any like big utility covers in the street because we want to make sure that you're clear of those. Um, you know, some streets have underground pg and &E transformers if there was to be power outage or some other emergency, we want to make sure those are clear and accessible. Um, the other thing we, sh we want to see is the location of any fire hydrants, including the required clearance around the fire hydrant, uh, so that if the fire department needs to access them, we have the clearance that they need. And also, the location of any fire escapes on the adjacent businesses, because if people need to or, or buildings, rather. If people need to get out of those buildings, we need to make sure that the area around those fire escapes are clear. So a lot of things uh, to consider, but again, the more uh, thorough you are when you're preparing the site plan, um, the better we'll be able to help you plan your, your closure to make sure that everything is in a place where it's going to be safe uh, for, for people to attend. Please. I know you're engineers, so you're looking at it different. <laughs> That's very true, but... Um, Do we have a site plan that we can submit to maybe get feedback? Or? Absolutely. Absolutely. Send us your best shot. And like I said, it doesn't need to look like this. This is a little intimidating, and it's not really a great example of what we typically get. And I'm not expecting to get this, but what I'm looking for when I review these are those components, right? Where is the emergency access lane? Where are the fire hydrants? Do they have the clearance that they need? If you can show me, boom, here's the emergency access lane right in the middle, and I can do a quick look, oh, all the other stuff is out of that lane, perfect, check, right? Oh, here's the fire hydrant, and the nearest booth is sent back. They have the clearance they need, check. Oh, here's their trash can, so I know they're thinking about waste management. Check, right? But that's the approach that I'm looking for. I'm looking for all the components. I'm, I'm not concerned about the, the visual style of the, of the site plan. We've gotten all different kind of site plans, some hand-drawn, some done in Microsoft Word, some done in, in other programs. Whatever you're most comfortable with and whatever is easiest for you, do your best, submit it, and then if we need more, we'll work with you to improve or add those things. Please. Um, is it the same case for like activities being offered to, to add more in, and in case, like, I guess in the, if we're applying for applications that are going for a year, it sometimes 
hard to, to know exactly when you're going to have a stage or if you're going to have a stage. Is it yeah. best to just apply and throw literally everything in there and then you are able to, like, we're able to cross it out or? Yeah, I think that's, I think that is the case because when we're reviewing these, we're looking, we're, <coughs> we're expecting that this is going to be your setup week after week. If you're taking components out on some weeks, that's fine. But if you're adding components that we haven't reviewed and we and we come by for an inspection, then maybe you haven't considered something that we would have uh, that we might have concerns about when reviewing your application. So really we want to make sure that when we're reviewing these applications, we get the entire picture. And then if you want to pick and choose which elements occur um, on a weekly basis, then and I guess like if we needed to say move the food tents to the other side or slightly down the block, it's not interfering with fire hydrants and all that kind of stuff. Is that the type of review that you'd be accepting or is that an entirely new application? I think it's 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 treading the line and so I I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer, but I'm say I, I would say if you're concerned about that or something comes up and you say, Oh, this is really better if it's if we rearrange these things, reach out to us, let us know what you're thinking about, and then we can talk through you know, what that looks like. Yeah, it, it, I'll just share, I don't think it's particularly realistic for folks to know exactly where everything needs to be for the entire year. Yeah, especially, um, especially for the newer events, I can see what, how that can be difficult. And well, like I said, we, we're trying to strike this balance between being able to do a review uh, with all of our agency partners, with Public Works, with the fire department, to make sure that all everybody gets a chance to you know, see their concerns addressed and get the information they need to be comfortable with what's going on. But we certainly want to encourage you to continue to refine your events and your programming to make sure that they're working for the community and they're serving the neighborhood so, um, you know, reach out to us, start that dialogue, and, and we'll work with you on that. All right. Uh, another thing that we're going to require before um, we issue you a permit is uh, insurance documentation. Um, this is uh, an example of a certificate of insurance that outlines uh, you know, what insurance coverage you have. Um, there is a specific, uh, there is some specific information that we'll need on that. And that's uh, generally the, the um, address at the bottom. I think, Monica, we probably want I think I think we grabbed this slide from the, uh, from, the parklet? from the parklet one, yeah, which okay. those are public works. Yeah. So apologies. Um, we will. We, I, I have an insurance requirements document that I can send that you can then just pass along to your insurance company with that language. Many many of you may already have it if you've done events in the past because it's pretty similar. But we're gonna want a specific a name and address on that insurance certificate um, so that, uh, and we're also going to want this additional insured endorsement. And so that specific language that we're gonna wanna see is the city and county of San Francisco, uh, not recreation and parks department, but it's agents, employees, and commissioner. Agents, employees, city and county of San Francisco. Officers, agents, and employees is what, yeah, uh, I apologize. I think we're grabbing these from different places. But we're gonna have specific requirements for insurance, um, and that insurance documentation is something that will send you uh, a template for what we wanna see, and then you can pass that along to your insurance. This is not in the initial application. This is not in the initial application. Yes, that's right. This is the next step. As we're reviewing your application and uh, issuing you a permit, we're going to tell you, 
here are the insurance requirements. In order for this permit to be valid, we expect you to maintain this insurance. And then we'll ask for a copy so we have it for our rents. Here is what you're going to need when you apply. So a lot of this is pretty obvious. Contact information, uh, a business account number if you have it. Uh, if you don't have a business account number, there's an option to check a box and proceed anyway. Um, you'll need to obviously know the location, the times that you're proposing, the dates that you're proposing. Uh, we're going to ask you to provide a description of how you're going to use the space, including um, you know, what you put out in the street, and um, similar to the Similar to the site plan that we looked at before, the more detailed you can be in that description, the better we're going to be able to help you get what you need to be able to, to carry out your use of the space successfully. Um, you're going to want to know about what you're putting out in the street, um, where it's going to go, create that site plan. You're going to need to know if there's alcohol service included because that triggers <coughs> another level of review. Um, and uh, so when you submit the, f the form, everything in this upper section are going to be things that you type in to the form itself, and then you're going to be asked to attach a few things. You're going to be asked to attach the site plan that you prepared. You're going to be asked to attach the community support documentation that we talked about earlier. Um, and then you're going to be asked to include a few photos of your space. Uh, and that's just so that we have uh, another way to kind of see what's what's going on out there on the street. Can I maybe just one note? Yeah, please. Um, just for the good of the group. Uh, once you begin the application, there is no way to save it. That's just a limitation of our website. Um, so all of this, this punch list, if you will, the application documents is meant to, for you to do the prep work so when you sit down to do the application, you complete it in one setting. I just don't want anyone to do a lot of work Thank you, Andy. That's that's good to know. Cal, please. Yeah. Um. I well, I wasn't. I didn't know we were going to be grandfathered in with the permit, so I rushed my application in because we were bumping up against one of the fee hikes. Uh, so I put mine in on Friday. Um. I I need to make some adjustments on it uh, because I don't recall that it let me put in the specific monthly dates. It seems to be geared toward weekly. Okay. It is geared toward weekly. And so I, I did see that that came in over the weekend. I haven't had a chance to look at it I figured too, too much uh, in depth yet. Um, but feel free to email us, okay. and we can almost certainly make those adjustments on the back end. Yeah, and, and in your case, we know that it, yeah, the form is, is geared more towards weekly events, so we'll work with you. And yeah, and uh, uh, right. I also have a, I'm going to uh, put a note in there, too, for the, our October event. Uh, we're working with the Barrison Street Fair, so I'm going to actually reduce our footprint okay, a little great. bit for that one. Uh, so I'll just make a note of that as well. Excellent. Appreciate it. Okay, so we've mentioned a few times today what additional permits that you might need. Um, if your activation is going to include amplified sound, music, performance, whatever, uh, you're going to need a permit from the Entertainment Commission for that. Uh, if you have uh, outdoor heating, cooking, etc., there's going to need to be uh, fire department permits for that. Uh, if you're going to, to have food service or cooking that occurs on your, uh, in your enclosure, you may also need uh, Public Health Department, Department of Public Health permits. Uh, if you have vendor sales, you may need vendor permits. So these are all things that you're going to um, be prompted to get once you get your street closure permit. Many of these agencies want to see your street closure permit first before they'll even take your application for these other things. Uh, and so that's another reason, and the primary reason, in fact, that we want you to come in early for these permits and and appreciate that many of you have because 
coming in early gives us the time we need to do our review, get you a permit, and get you in touch with all these all these folks. So part of our review, we're going to be flagging which other permits you may need, and then give you the right contact information so that you can um, get started on getting any of those additional permits. Um, this is street vendor permit. I don't know what before. So if a vendor is selling, I think more than two times a year, they're required to get a permit from Public Works. Um, yeah, more than two times a year. So I think that's, so obviously if you're having a, like a farmer's market or a vendor market closure, your vendors probably already have it, um, but if they don't, they'll need to obtain one of those if they're gonna be selling you know, weekly or monthly. I have a question about having a food truck. We've never had a food truck at any event, but Do they bring their own permits that I have to check, or do I have to notify you and ask for a modification for the location of the food truck, and do I have to notify the fire department? Both of them. So I, I can answer that. Okay. So food trucks in San Francisco, um, fire department uh, does regulate them. They're all required to have permits, um, and their permit covers them for a year, uh -huh. um, and, and we also approve their locations. So if you're going to have a food truck um, at one of your street closures, we need to see on the dry street drawing where, where that where food could truck be. would be positioned. Mm -hmm. And then we also need uh, copies of their uh, current inspection form and, and, and their permit okay, uh, so for the propane. Okay, so when I do the application in the site plan, I could ask where a food truck could be. I, I mean, we're talking about maybe one or two times in a year or some one event, but to have it in the initial application as a possibility, or would it be better for me to do what we mostly do and then come back and ask, like, I guess that, that's a perfect so, yeah. question when, the, when they review it. Like, would we even be able to put one near the event? I suppose we have a bus zone in front of City Lights. Yeah. There's a bus zone there that's used from time to time. There's a taxi zone that blocks, it's, it's at the opening of the alley. This is on the Columbus side. Then there are two, well then there's commercial parking in front of that. So I guess I could on the ask to have a couple of the commercial spaces put aside for a possible food truck and not be, so anyway, yeah. that's yeah, a Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll need to handle. review it. So whether, whether you submit the, it with your initial drawing, Mm -hmm. um, or months down the road, you, you decide to put a food truck in, we'll need to review okay, it then. That's the, thank you for answering uh, so the question. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think if I could speak a little more generally and beyond the fire department uh, aspect of permitting food trucks. Food trucks that are in a recurring location, whether it's weekly or monthly, require a mobile food facility from Public Works, and that's a very involved and time-consuming process. So generally, food trucks and shared spaces don't mix well with each other. What you're talking about, though, a couple times a year for larger events, that's probably something that's better handled through the special events permitting process, because there we can uh, work with the fire department to, pr to permit food trucks for uh, a few you know, special days or larger activations. Okay, beyond you. the footprint of your of your shared space. Okay, thank you. So I think that's probably the right way to handle that. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, Joe, I know this is an entertainment commission thing, not you necessarily, but you know what kind of uh, the jam uh, uh, program is still ongoing? Or if they the jam up? permit ends March 31st. They I do don't know, well. Monica or Renan, if you have more. It's time. just a retitling. So it's it's you know, you're still going to be able to have a amplified sound uh, permit um, if you haven't signed up for the entertainment commission newsletter. Um, I can point you in that direction after, okay. uh, but they have all the information about the process. But it is still part of um, shared spaces, and we have okay. it on our yeah. website as I, well. They, they want you to reapply. Uh, I think yes. by January 15th, you yes. need to reapply to transition to the new, from your jam to the new, whatever it is. Anything under the shared spaces <coughs> umbrella, including jam permits, including 
roadway closures, park clips, people in care permits, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, all of those applications are due January. Okay, I'd really be able to. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for adding that. I and I, and we can, um, I can send her an email to the group as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's short work. You know, I can make it as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, just quickly to talk through the process so you know what to expect once you submit your application. So uh, the applications are due uh, later this week, January 15th. Um, once your application is received, we'll review it, we'll look at your site plan, we have comments, questions, need more information, we'll reach out to you and, and start that dialogue. Once we have everything we need to proceed with your application, um, we're going to schedule you for a Giscott public hearing. So that's what I mentioned before. Uh, in advance of that hearing, we're gonna share your application with all of our agency partners, um, and they will attend that hearing as well. So the Giscott Committee is the Interdepartmental Committee on Traffic and Transportation. It's led by the SFMTA, but it includes representatives from the fire department, from the police department, from public works, from uh, public health uh, and planning. And so um, all of those department representatives will take a look and they may reach out to you in advance of the hearing with questions or at the hearing itself, they may have questions. So we'll ask you to attend. As we talked about before, it's also an opportunity for any of members of the public provide comments on the on the proposal um, in advance of that hearing we'll be asking you to post a notice we'll send you a, a notice to print out and just put on polls it's very similar to what uh, many of you have been doing during the pandemic uh, permit um, once the committee hears your application and uh, has a chance to hear any feedback from the community uh, they'll decide to either approve your permit and we'll proceed with issuing it. Uh, if there's concerns, we may hold your permit and work with you to resolve those concerns if possible. Um, but in theory, by the time you're getting to this public hearing, uh, we've had a chance to work out any of those issues ahead of time. That's really our goal. Uh, then once we issue you a permit, we're gonna reach out to you uh, and work with you to range of time to deliver your barricades and materials so you're all set up for your first event. What are the hearings we do? The hearings that we're doing right now are virtual. That's a great question. So we're doing them online. We're using Microsoft Teams. Um, we'll give you instructions for you know how to join and a link to join the meeting in advance of the hearing. So here are some successful examples of shared space roadway closures that we've done throughout the pandemic. Um, this is on Golden Gate Avenue in the Tenderloin for St. Anthony's. Uh, early on in the pandemic, they were challenged uh, by the fact that they weren't able to provide the community services that they normally provide indoors. And so this was an opportunity, opportunity for them to continue to provide those same services out, outdoors um, for you know health reasons. But throughout the pandemic, they've also learned that being able to provide these services out on the street makes it more visible to the community. And so they're able to attract people that might not otherwise know about these services. So that's one example of how having this activation can uh, increase their uh, ability to serve the, their community. Uh, another example here that we have is uh, on, in Grant, on Grant Avenue in Chinatown. Um, I've always looked forward to the series of street fairs that the Chinatown community has, you know, for Lunar New Year and then the fall for Autumn Moon Festival. Um, but this has been a way to uh, draw not just tourists to the neighborhood, but also um, you know locals who come for shopping and, and to see these businesses and to visit these businesses. So this is another great way to be able to draw people to this um, business district and this community. 
Hayes is another example of like a merchant community that's come together to organize a street closure. They've had a varying footprint over the course of the pandemic to deal with um, the changing needs of their community. But you know, Hayes has both restaurants and retail stores, and they've uh, found that uh, a weekend closure has allowed them to again attract people to all different kinds of businesses. It's been a really lively space and a great kind of atmosphere for a weekend meal out with some shopping, with, um, you know, um, and a chance to just kind of enjoy some fresh air. All right, here we have some uh, resources that aren't that uh, useful to you because they're <laughs> links on the slide, yeah, but we're all of the resources. Perfect. <laughs> slide deck on our website later today, as well as the recordings, so you guys will have Great. it to reference at any time. Like. Excellent. Um, but certainly, please do check out these resources because there's a ton of good information in there um, that will help you when you put together your applications. Um, It's we just with June or do we go a whole year? It's a year from whenever you start. Okay. So it, it's gonna it can be whatever start date to whatever end date, just no more than a year. And then after you know, as we're approaching the end of that year, if you want to continue for a second year, um, then you can apply again. And in the interest of streamlining, can we, if there are no changes, can we apply like that? We're just going to continue for a year with yeah, updated absolutely. insurance documents, etc. So absolutely, just, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Streamlining. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Like absolutely. If your if your site plan has not changed, mm -hmm. then and you know, please use it again. Okay. Um, Yes, the transition between the pandemic era and the legislative program. So right now our street closure is is every day. It's every day. It is um, it covers the operation of the Subio on the uh, adjacent sidewalks. You know the air, the, the alley is very narrow with two narrow sidewalks on either side. And we have tables and chairs each side, smaller ones on one side, a little bit more on the other, to maintain that open way. Um, that is permitted for alcohol service, and that is permitted under our, the pandemic era ABC, um, you know, increasing our permitted space for alcohol sales. And so, it's 21 and over in that space. And one of the things that I really like about, and you know, when we're in normal operation, but even when we have events, it's 21 and over, even the full under 21 can go through the alley and they can hang out on the side and enjoy the events. Everything is free, everything is open to the public, and no, there's no um, walking of access of pedestrians. So, and it's compliant with the ADA access. So, what I like about this program is it looks like we would be able, I, I, and I'm not sure, to operate our tables and chairs, would we be able to have people under 21 in the currently permitted space? Or would we have to change our operation? So there's a, there's a, per, the yeah. part of the public works for our ongoing everyday operation. We need, the, we need the roadway closure anyway. Mm -hmm. But how do we navigate that different? Right? That, that this would actually allow people of all ages to enjoy musical events or poetry events because City Lights will have a letter of support for this because they also use a, our permits to do things from time to time. So ABC, if I may, um, ABC is in the process of revising its regulations mm -hmm. um, as, it, as it comes to um, outdoor dining. So we're, it's something we're monitoring, but I think right now that there's going to be an unknown um, mm -hmm. about um, the way that 
outdoor dining I'm, in terms of serve tech and its ability to serve alcohol uh, about what that's going to look like. Um, but as soon as we know from ABC, we'll be sending out communications about it. Okay, well, we really hope that we've been operating responsibly yeah. in your eyes and the city's eyes and that you will advocate for us to These are state, continue. statewide right, but advocate for us at the state yeah. level to make sure that these programs are continuing. But okay, so tables and chairs, I guess that that is the question. Like shared spaces, I can make my drawing and that'll be good for the events that we do that are covered. Um, yeah, it it's a funny situation with us, so I'm not sure where I should go. Like I, I wanna just yeah. Start, start with you and you permit my site plan right and i'll know that i'll be able to have so many events a month right with that but then ongoing operation yeah i think it, it it is it's a little challenging because it really is related to what ebc requires when it comes to alcohol sales mm -hmm. um and i must admit that i'm not thoroughly familiar with those requirements, but okay. um, and I'll approach the closure. We have it requested. I mean, it's a, it's long. Like any, I guess, restaurant would would have as well if they did. I did. I I need to figure this out. So yeah, yeah. I have a. Um, we can have a sidebar uh, conversation because there is actually another example of another street that is going to be permanently closed and, mm -hmm. and also kind of so we can. Yeah, I'll find because yeah. it's a kind of unique situation. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. And we had fortunately tremendous community support for our current operation because it has improved the alley tremendously. Mm -hmm. It has completely changed Caroline from pre-pandemic to today. That's great. Yeah, it is much safer. It is much cleaner. It is. Yeah. I, I do want to make. I know we're almost out of time. This is a perfect segue because I feel like you may have glossed over. And I just want to make sure it's really clear because it's an important parameter. We talked about the minimum threshold for a shared space, meaning like if it's once a year, that's not that's a special event, right? So we talked about the recurring nature, but we didn't talk about necessarily just the upper limit. So if meaning in the code in the shared spaces code, it calls out four days a week or ten or over ten, more than four hours a week or more than ten hours a day would not be eligible as a shared space. That's considered more permanent. Um, and so, yeah, four days a week, 10 hours a day, stay under that is an important thing. Put that on the slide, I'm trying to remember if we call that. Wait, 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 okay, wait. So hold it, say, just say that one so more time. Four days a week. 10, hour, um, 10 hours a day. If it's more than day. that, it is considered. Four days a week. And four days, and four days a week is considered okay. more permanent and would need to go through probably like an MTA board, a different approval process that is longer or different than it, it still goes to ISCA, but then it goes to MTA board after that because it's like considered a more permanent closure. Okay, and so I, I could approach this by doing it Wednesdays, weekly Wednesdays, monthly, by, by, by uh, Sunday, you know, yeah. after, you know, Sunday. Well, Wednesdays so, and Sundays, so that would... So examples of four days a week would be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, weekly. So every Thursday.